This image, and this one, and this one, and these. They all have something in common. They were all made by machines, generative artificial intelligence software to be exact. It's a somewhat new field taking the tech world by storm. Generative AI can write blog posts, tweets, academic papers, and news stories. They can also now produce works of art that win prizes, like this one, which won the Colorado State Fair Art Contest. And soon, some people think they could replace the armies of visual effects artists needed to work on blockbuster movies, and democratize that kind of visual firepower to anyone with an internet connection, who is, of course, willing to pay for those tools. And even for non-artists, these tools could become AI-powered personal assistants, creating slides for presentations or writing blog posts in minutes as opposed to hours. Silicon Valley venture capital firms are pouring hundreds of millions into these companies. Stability AI, OpenAI, and MidJourney. There's a lot of hype around generative AI. Is it the next big thing in tech, or another hyped up fad that goes bust? Generative AI is here today, and it works. So generative AI refers to a type of AI model that automates the creation of content. Generative AI is new because generative AI, these programs create images, and these images have never been seen before anywhere. Most of AI in the last couple of decades has really been around analyzing existing data. So you know, finding an anomaly in data, uh, detecting fraud, making a movie recommendation. Generative AI is very different. It allows you to create brand new content. That content can be text, like a news article, or poetry, or marketing copy in a website. It can be image, uh, let's say, a character in a movie, or uh, creating a new scene. It could be video, it could even be audio, like creating brand new music. And you can give them any you know, phrase that, no matter how absurd, and it's gonna make something that's pretty close to you know, what you want. If I wanted to say, I wanna see a black cat on the moon in the style of Pablo Picasso, it will do that for you, even though you know, no one has ever asked to do that before. These programs are, are based on a subset of machine learning that's gotten a lot of attention the last 10 years, which is called deep learning. Deep learning uh, uses neural networks or, or matrix equations, basically, to, to ingest data and learn about relationships in that data and give you, at the end, uh, what is called a model with weights in it that allow it to do these magic things. Companies of all shapes and sizes are involved in AI. I mean, both Meta and Google have generative AI algorithms. A lot of people are using the models more like toys right now. A website like Shutterstock or Getty Images may be able to incorporate AI-generated imagery into their product offerings. I mean, Getty in particular has said they're not going to do it and they're gonna ban it. But I think the theory I heard the most when I was doing the, my reporting is that there'll be a layer of what people have called API companies, where you have big giants do a lot of the training of these giant models and then offer access to those models to individuals and to smaller companies through what's called an API or application programming interface, where they basically make a call to the open AI server or the, the, or the stable diffusion server, and, and then th that becomes a part of the infrastructure. And so a lot of VCs and a lot of people in the space were excited about you know, this API model. Unlike other hyped up technologies that have received hundreds of millions of dollars from VC firms like crypto or Web3, Generative AI tools are here now and available to anyone who wants to use them. Some are free, some are paid apps, but the tools are ready to use. So my name's um, Sarah Drummond. I'm a designer and a filmmaker. Uh, so I kind of cross the boundaries between uh, doing designing for like user experience and services and making films really. And I run a school called the School of Good Services where we train people how to design great services basically. Part of Drummond's job includes sketching out storyboard scenes and different product designs and workflows. She began to employ generative AI tools to do all of that for her. I think that would have taken me like a few hours maybe, like depends on what, what fidelity, right? But like, I mean, 
if I was doing it really quickly, um, and I might have done because I was in a bit of a rush, I normally use like little blob kind of drawings, <laughs> like they're really bad. They're like little, they look like little fat men, you know, doing various service interactions. But this thing took me like, I don't know, two minutes, three minutes. Uh, downloaded the squares, put it in and was like, whoa, this is sick. <laughs> Gaurav Gupta is a principal at Lightspeed Capital, a prominent VC firm who invested a big round with Stability AI. He also says he's already using generative AI tools in his day job. You know, for example, I, I, I like to write blog posts. OpenAI, for example, has a model called GPT-3, right? And that allows you to effectively give it a, give it a set of text, maybe the beginning of a sentence or a paragraph. It will automatically fill in the content that follows. And I oftentimes will use that when I've hit writer's block, you know, to give me a set of ideas of what I could write about next. It truly, I, I don't think of it as, as uh, it doing the work for me, but I think of it as a way to inspire, you know, my own writing. There's a long list of potential ethical concerns if generative AI does indeed take off. First, disinformation and misinformation. Think deepfakes, but on steroids. A classic example is, you know, taking the image and the voice of the president, having him say something he would have never done. Um, the consequences could be severe in the, in the, in the sense of you know, it creates misinformation and other things. These technologies can also be used to harass people, right? You could take an image of a, a person that you may not like and have them do something. Um, and, and it can have a lot of negative consequences. The second big issue revolves around copyright. Generative AI needs massively huge data sets in order to create digital art and other media. In some cases, the data set is a giant swath of the searchable internet. That means the software is using existing copyrighted art from real life artists, which could file real life lawsuits for infringing upon their work, especially if people use generative AI software to create art in the same exact style as their real life artists. Using big chunks of the internet as data sets could also introduce bias into the final products. The content that we're basing AI from is born out of the, that system, right? So when we have things like text prompts and we base uh, the text responses on maybe a community like Reddit, which we know maybe not so much now, but in the past has been particularly a certain way of political leaning, right? You're gonna more likely get responses that could potentially be racist, homophobic, etc. There's a fierce debate going on right now about how disruptive this technology will ultimately be. Some investors who I talk to, you know, see this as kind of the moment where the total market for, for something cool expands greatly from, from, you know, just the people, dedicated scientists and nerds who can, who can make the machines to really anyone who can use it. And, and when this happened before with PCs and smartphones, many, many fortunes were made. I think generative AI is very different. We've already seen explosion of real world use cases where this can help people's lives where it can make people more productive. So I think the use cases for generative AI are a lot more tangible and are here today. And we're already seeing the impact. I definitely do not think at this point in time it will replace jobs, but I do think that as creative artists, photographers, musicians, videographers, like, we should play with this stuff now so we can help define how it can help us do our jobs better. And then it's up to us to shape what we need it to do for us rather than be shaped by AI.